Hey everyone, and thanks for tuning in. In today's video, we'll be covering part two of a two-part series of videos. So in part one, we ran all of our analyses for a hierarchical regression. This included computing descriptive statistics, a correlation matrix, we estimated three separate regression models, um, as well as the corresponding R-squared change as we added sets of predictors. So remember, we, we um, estimated three regression models, and then in between uh, estimating regression model one and model two, we computed the R-squared change to see if adding another set of predictors would contribute a significant portion of variance explained and why. And then we did the same thing when going from model two to model three when we added X5. Um, so in this video for part two, uh, it's not program specific, so this will, uh, regardless of the program that you use, uh, we'll be going over how to display the results of our analyses in tables and how to interpret and write up the results at a publishable level. Uh, for this video, we'll be working in Microsoft Word, but you're free to use any word processing software that you choose. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. All right, so what I have open here is a Word document with the tables uh, that I pre-made that display the results of our analyses from last uh, from the last video. And then uh, let me zoom in here a little bit. So I have these tables, and then down here I have an example write-up, uh, which serves as an example interpretation of our hierarchical regression. So a couple notes before we get into the tables here. Um, so this is just one way to make tables. Uh, this is I've created this template and uploaded it online, so you're free to recycle it um, and use it for your own work if you uh, if you choose. Um, but there are many different ways um, to create tables, and there are many different acceptable ways to create tables. Sometimes the formatting uh, for APA, especially now with APA 7. Sometimes that can dictate um, the limits of what your tables can look like. But here I've just created some that, um, that I use when I publish. Um, so for tables, it's important to present things that are most relevant um, to your study or also that present, uh, that support uh, what you're trying to present in your study. So uh, again, this is different from selective reporting. So it's not about choosing what highlights significance or or uh, what evidence matches what you want to say in your study, but more so uh, we want to be concise with our tables. So present only the information that's necessary and um, have the table serve some kind of purpose um, instead of just uh, vomiting everything into tables and then hoping that that gets through uh, peer review. Um, so I did my best to reflect APA 7 uh, in these tables and the other thing I want to note is so here we have model 1, model 2, and then model 3 and typically only one of these tables will be presented in a manuscript and not all three. So depending on which one, so if you run a couple models, let's say you run three models like here, um, typically you'll just present one of these models, uh, whichever one you deem is the final model. You could also aggregate all of this information into one table from the three models um, if that's not too uh, space consuming. But I present them here, uh, all three of them, for completeness and for hopefully simplicity. Okay, so let's go ahead and get into what these tables are. So I have table one, and these are my descriptive statistics. So regardless of the program that we use, these are the descriptives that came out. And so I just have variable, sample size, mean, standard deviation, the minimum, and the maximum. Uh, in my experience, people typically don't report descriptive statistics, and that's fine, but uh, sometimes I'll include these. Uh, just for completeness. Um, and for descriptive statistics, sometimes you might want to include skew and kurtosis to show what the empirical distribution or what the observed distributions are of your variables. So uh, what goes into the tables here for descriptive statistics can be switched out and swapped out depending on what's most relevant for your study. All right. 
<clears throat> here I have a correlation matrix. Uh, this is pretty standard, so you'll have the variable names up at the top here for the rows, and then you'll have the same variable names here for, actually these are the column, um, this is the column heading, and then you'll have the same variable names here for the row heading. And then I typically only present one, um, one half of the matrix, so I present either the lower triangle or the upper triangle. So I'll include the ones on the diagonals to indicate that it's a correlation matrix, and then I will just fill in uh, this bottom portion here. Because remember, for correlation matrices, all of these values will simply be a reflection um, up here. So it's redundant information that you can leave out. All right, so that's our correlation matrix. Uh, moving on to table three, we have our first uh, model. So model one, and remember from the last video that model one included x1 and x2 as predictors. So we had two predictors. And so here I include the coefficient name. So we have the intercept and then b1 and b2. I include the estimate, the standard error, and then the associated p-value, which here I've indicated they're all less than 0.05. Um, and then here in the note, I include the F statistic for the model, and then whether that's significant or not. I include R squared, and I also include adjusted R squared. So the way that I denote uh, adjusted R squared is R squared, and then subscripted is ADJ. Okay. Moving on to model uh, number two for table four. So here we now have, in addition to x1 and x2, we've added x3 and x4 as predictors. So we can see that here in this bottom row. And it's the same format as um, table three for model one. So coefficient, estimate, standard error, and then the associated p-values. Again, I have the corresponding F statistic for the model, the R squared, and then the adjusted R squared. Okay, and then finally, our last uh, table of coefficients, we have the final model, which is model three. And in addition to X1 through X4, we've added X5 as a predictor. And so we can see that here in the last row. And then again, we have coefficient, estimate, standard error, and p-value. In the note, I've included the F statistic, R squared, and adjusted R squared. All right. And then this last table here, table six, is a summary of the R squared change. And that's what I mean uh, with this triangle here which you can find in symbols. Um, so for set one, I had x1 and x2 as predictors. And again, we don't have an f, um, an r squared change f value here, or a p value for the f statistic here, because this was our initial model. And then for set two, when we added x3 and x4, that f statistic was, uh, the p value for that f statistic was less than 0.05, so we had a significant increase in r squared. And then for set three, which was only x5, when we added that predictor, that change in r squared was also statistically significant given our f statistic for the r squared change. All right, so that's how I've organized all of the information from um, estimating our three models as well as our descriptive statistics and our correlation matrix. Now we're going to move on to the, uh, the example write-up. So how do we interpret this? All right, so the way that I've broken this up, I have two paragraphs here. This first paragraph goes over the, um, uh, more so the models, the different models that we're testing, and then, um, adding in sets of predictors and then R squared change. And then this bottom paragraph here, the second paragraph, goes more in detail about the model that we choose. So for this example, I chose the third model. 
um, which is the model with all five predictors. And then I go into more detail about that particular model. So you can think of it as kind of like the first paragraph is more general, and then the second paragraph is a little bit more specific regarding our final model. So this is how the interpretation goes. A hierarchical design was employed, which used three models. One, model one predicted y from x1 and x2. Two, model two added x3 and x4. And three, model three added x5. The model fit, the model predicting y from x1 and x2 accounted for a significant amount of variance. So this is our model f and corresponding p-value. The addition of x3 and x4 significantly increased the variance accounted for in y. Now this F statistic, this is not the model F, this is the F test for R squared change, which was significant, which indicates that there is a significant increase in variance accounted for in Y from model one to model two, where we added X3 and X4. Moving on to the next sentence, this new model did account for a significant amount of variance in Y. So here, this is the model F for model two. The final addition of X5 to the model led to another significant increase in variance accounted for in Y. Again, this is the F statistic for the R squared change, which again was significant. This third model did not, or this third model did account for a significant amount of variance in Y. And then again, this is the F statistic for the third model, which accounted for a significant amount of variance in Y. All right. So as you can see, it was kind of a, sequ a sequential process where we started with our base model, model one, with x1 and x2 as predictors. Then we added another set of predictors, x3 and x4, and that, that led to a significant increase in R squared. And then finally, we added our third set, which consisted of x5, and that again led to a significant increase in R squared. So that's why I'm choosing the final or the third model as our final model. And that is the one that I will interpret down here in the second paragraph. So the final model included all five predictors, x1, x2, x3, x4, and x5. Overall, the final model accounted for approximately 42% of the variance in y. And I'm just reporting um, regular old R squared here. Each of the five predictors was, was a significant predictor of y, independent of one another. And then here I have a blanket p-value. So this is, I'm just saying that all of the p-values for the t-statistics for each predictor was less than 0.05. So that way here, I'm kind of slipping by with that reporting all of the t-statistics, which isn't, which um, doesn't always have to be a necessary requirement. When all five predictors are equal to zero, y is expected to be 14.69. So that's the interpretation for our intercept. And then here, to finish off uh, the write-up, these are the uh, interpretations for each predictor. So it's going to sound redundant, but I have them all here for completeness. For every one unit increase in x1, y is expected to increase 0.49 units, holding all other predictors constant. For every one unit increase in x2, y is expected to increase 0.82 units, holding all other predictors constant. For every one unit increase in x3, y is expected to increase 1.63 units, holding all other predictors constant. For every one unit increase in x4, y is expected to increase 1.71 units, holding all other predictors constant. And finally, for every one unit increase in x5, y is expected to increase 1.12 units, holding all other predictors constant. That's a mouthful, but... Um, I just want to make sure that I'm being thorough. So um, all the information from here is neatly summarized in this uh, table right here. Or actually, that's where I drew all of these uh, coefficients. Now remember, so this uh, paragraph is only in reference to this table here, table 5, which is about model 3. Whereas uh, this first paragraph is referencing all of the models that we tested and kind of uh, lending support for why we chose model three as our final model. All right, so uh, 
again, you know, we went over uh, how to organize our information uh, that we've gathered from our analyses uh, with the descriptive statistics and correlation matrix first. And then uh, a table for each of our models, model one, model two, and model three, as well as a table summarizing um, the R squared change and uh, the three sets of predictors that we have entered in. And then we also uh, went over a example write up, an example write up for our, our hierarchical regression. So with that, that concludes this video on write up in tables for hierarchical regression.